Watch Symposium. I'm Austin. All right, so a paid question for Tom. He writes straight to the point, what watch should I get next? Here's the situation. I have a 14060M. That's his first Rolex, and that's a no-date sub. A 16700 Pepsi. So that's a straight GMT Master bought in 2019. And a Hoyer Monza Classic, which was my first nice watch given to me from my dad. I have a rough 10,000 pounds budget for another watch. So in USD, that's 13,100 USD, or in Japanese yen, that's 1,430,000 Japanese yen. So basically 10,000 pounds to work with. I like the Kermit Steel Daytonas and also the AP Daydate 36 millimeter. What is my collection missing? What would be a good buy to add to it? Don't stick to just those options. I want your opinion, suggestions, on my next move. Thanks, Austin. Excited to hear your thoughts in a video, Tom. All right, thanks for the question, Tom. All right, so let's look at his existing collection. He's got the Hoyer Monza Classic. That's a chronograph. It's his first good watch, and he got it from his father. So if nothing else, that's a piece that's there to stay for sentimental reasons, and it gives him a chronograph. And then he's got his two Rolexes. His first was the 14060M. And in my opinion, this is the best sub, period. This no-date 14060M. Now, uh, let's take a look at his. His is uh, a two-liner, which I think is great. You have that uncluttered, minimalist dial. The 14060M was released in 1999, and they started making the, the two-liner 14060M M up until 2006, and then from 2007, uh, it became a four-liner, and I think the two-liner is the one to have. I think the it's just more vintage looking, and basically, this is just the perfect blend of modern and vintage. You have uh, a more vintage-inspired case, and you have, it's a pre-ceramic bezel insert. You don't have that big fat case of the six-digit modern sub. Um, but you've got a you know modern aspects like uh, the the sapphire crystal and a, a more modern movement. I've got a one four six zero and that has the three thousand movement. Now this one has the thirty one thirty movement, which is basically like a dateless thirty one thirty five movement. And the difference between what mine has the three thousand and and the thirty one thirty that's in Tom's is the, uh, mine has a balance cock where his has a full balance bridge and mine also has, I want to say the, the balance wheel is smaller on mine and the balance wheel I think is bigger on his and basically it's just an improved movement and, and that's what the M stands for. It's basically just like the 14060 that I have but just the better movement and his also has the Luminova. It's a, a Swiss made dial and you know, this is a, a watch that's dated from 1999 to 2006. And this is excellent. This is all you need. Which, what do you need next? Really nothing. But I know that's not the answer you're looking for, right? But uh, this, is, this is the perfect sub and, and very likely the perfect watch, period. All right. Um, he's also got a 16700. That's a straight GMT Master as opposed to a Master II. And he bought that in 2019. And I'm looking at it, it's got a tritium dial. So it's a 1996 watch or earlier. In 1997, they came out with the, the Luminova. So that would be a Swiss dial, U serial, 1997, 1998, and then 1999 went to A, where they started using the Super Luminova, and you have the Swiss made on there. So this is a tritium dialed watch so this would be 1996 or earlier and um and and that's fantastic honestly i mean this is this is perfect this is everything you really need but i know you've 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 been bitten by the bug and you want to know what you need to go for going forward and before i start let me just tell you what i think you don't need and that's another tritium dialed watch i think you have it in the 16700 if you have that watch serviced at RSC, you may lose those tritium hands, so I'd be careful going forward. I would probably 
only have that serviced at uh, a trusted independent. Now, I'm sure people will write in and say, they ask you if they can replace the parts. Well, here's the thing. They'll, what they'll do is they'll, they'll say, we may need to change the hands, okay? And I think what that does is that covers them if something happens and the watchmaker's taken off the hands and the tritium cracks, they're gonna have to replace those hands. They cannot put cracked tritium hands back in your watch. And they're gonna have to replace them because they don't have tritium hands anymore with Luminova and they need to make sure that's okay beforehand. So they may get you to okay that and who knows if you've got a shystery uh, watchmaker, the hands could disappear. I don't know what could happen, but but I wouldn't trust this watch to RSC for services going forward, all right? You may get lucky, like I did, and, and get your hands back, but eventually your luck will run out. And for that reason, I wouldn't get another tritium dialed watch. It's good that you have one because you can enjoy it and watch the tritium patina, maybe put it in a dark place and, and have fun with that. But for usability going forward, I would just stick to Swiss or Swiss made dials only if you're gonna go Rolex. All right, um, now, so that's that's what I wouldn't do. All right, I wouldn't do another Tritium watch because you've already kind of checked that box off. And I would also, if you're gonna go Rolex or maybe other pieces, I might just uh, say I wouldn't go non-box and papers or polished, okay? Now that's just what I would do, but it's kind of a, a good, not rule, but it's just sort of a good ideal to look for in your next purchase. And you know, you can always change it because sometimes a piece comes along and it's nearly perfect and, and you think, well, that's okay, I'm gonna let that requirement slide. And that's what happened with, with my 16710 GMT Master II piece serial. It was unpolished. It was the cheapest one in Japan. Didn't have papers. Okay, that's all right. I let that slide and, and I got it anyway. Now I have service papers for it. Um, but what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't get a polished piece that also has no box and papers. Okay, that's just too much. I was looking at a 14060M the other day. It had the frog foot uh, coronet, which is more like a, like a um, almost looks like a tiara. Okay, kind of rare. Happen, happened on the 2007 uh, Z serials. And great price, but no box, no papers, been polished, just couldn't do it. And uh, so anyway, I still know where that watch is. If, if you're curious and you're, you're interested, maybe shoot me an email and, and I could help you out with that. Um, for a price, right? Uh, anyway, all right, so that's what I wouldn't do. Okay, so now you mentioned the Kermit and the Daytona. And let's talk about the Kermit and the Daytona. Well, actually, let's talk about the AP first, okay? I'm not gonna talk much about the AP because I wouldn't I wouldn't get an AP because the service costs are just too much. Now, I know luxury watches are made for the affluent and wealthy, but I think service costs on APs are gratuitous. And I think it's kind of bordering on, this is for, the wealthy, so we're just gonna service cost wise rape you. And if you're okay with that, you're our customer. Uh, but if but if you're not, you might not be. And I'm not okay with that. So um, I, I would never buy an AP. And the brand just doesn't speak to me. So if you're gonna go AP, you're on your own there. But um, it's just not what I would do uh, because of the service costs. And um, yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm going to focus then on on the Kermit, the Daytona, and we'll talk about some other things, but you talk about the Kermit and Daytona, and if you love those watches and they're your grails, I would say you kind of have to go for them. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people that thinks that you should go after your grails, assuming your grails are in reach and within reach, and, and these are, okay? So if you're, you know, if Thank goodness that I've got pretty down-to-earth grails. You know, if I like the Jacob & Co. $2 million producer Michael solar system watch, okay, that's kind of crazy, all right? Um, but if you're like me and you appear to be, your your grails are rel relatively attainable. And 
if they are your grails, I would go for them because I could make some other suggestions and I will, but if you love and want a Kermit and a Daytona, um, everything else is going to pale in comparison. And when, when you do get those pieces, uh, even if you have to pay out the nose for them, it's going to be a huge sense of accomplishment. And you got to ask yourself, is that what you really want? And if so, I would say, forget everything, go forward. Um, having said that, you've missed the boat on the Kermits. Okay, that's I'm stating the obvious. I have too. I love the Kermit. I think it's a great watch. It's a transition watch. You have the uh, the pre-ceramic, but then you've got the the maxi dial and the maxi hands, and uh, it's it's a very special watch. Now, with your kind of money, looking on Chrono Twenty Four, you could get a Kermit. It would be sans box and papers. Wouldn't go that route. A Kermit is a very collectible watch, and and you're gonna want box and papers. Non-polished would be perfect, but that might be a little, you might just have to forgo that requirement because that might really, you might really get up into like the 20,000 stuff if, if the seller really knows what he has, uh, a non-polished, basically unworn or, you know. Uh, so for, for what you have, for I would say maybe a thousand pounds more you can start getting into the box and papers kermits and and that's what i would go for uh having said that i don't know that the kermit is going to be a usable piece i mean i would love a kermit but you guys know me do you think i'm going to wear the kermit absolutely not i'm going to stick it in some safe somewhere and hoard it and caress it once a month um and and that's especially the case if it's something like a flat four um flat fours in japan go for ten thousand dollars more than a straight kermit which are already up there what you're paying for and and this is why i love this hobby because it's insane it's crazy but it makes perfect sense you're paying ten thousand dollars for that aluminum ring it's insane it's it's great i mean uh it's great in its absurdity um but that that's a very expensive bezel and the idea of whacking that bezel on a door jam or scratching it or god forbid scratching the fat four itself to where you can't even tell us a fat four I mean, that's a nightmare scenario and and you know a good bump of that fat four bezel is like thousands <laughs> off with each bump so uh, so if you were to say get a fat four and, and, and you don't quite have the money for that, but I'm just saying if, if you did have, if somebody had a fat four, all right, I would consider taking off the bezel yourself, popping it off, taking it to RSC during its next, next service and, and telling them you lost the bezel and getting a replacement bezel just to make it more usable and then, and then kind of put that fat four bezel to the side, just keep it, just hoard it. Because that that bezels, you know, it's a ten thousand dollar bezel. Um, if it's if it's just a a regular Kermit, then um, I'm assuming that the service bezels are the same. But it's all about the bezel with the Kermit. So you got to be so careful with the bezel because it's all about the bezel, right? Um, so I love I love the Kermit, but. Um, if I did get one, it's I don't think I would enjoy it. It would become like the bait of my existence, and I would just get it out once a month to wind it and hoard it and and caress it, and I would never wear it. Um, but that's not to say I don't love them and want one. But uh, that's something to, to keep in mind. But yes, you, you're you're in the price range for that, and I would go Kermit over the Daytona, to be honest, um, because they're not making the Kermit anymore, and I think now's probably the best time to get one. I can't see them dropping in price in the future. Um, but they are still making the Daytona and you're talking pounds. So you seem to be living in Britain. And if you are, I think you can get yourself on a list. I think they make and take lists at ADs there. And that's what I would do. And that could get yourself um, that Daytona. I, I wouldn't I just have a thing about not paying over retail at like gray market dealers. I just I will never do it, especially if it's like a, a modern piece and um and so that's why if, if I were you I would I would put yourself on, on the list at an A D and maybe try to make some friends and be charming there and hopefully it can work out. Uh but again you're you seem to be in the price range of a retail uh 
Daytona at, at an AD. So I'd put yourself on the list for that. I would decide which one you want. And um, I would put yourself on the, the list for a Daytona and then casually hunt a Kermit, okay? That is if you have identified those as your grail. And if you have, you've got to go for them, okay? Uh, nothing else will satisfy in my experience. Don't settle, all right? Um, but assuming that you want some other ideas, uh, we'll, we'll go that route. Now, looking at your collection objectively, somebody might say, so you got the chrono, okay? You got the chronograph. You've got the diver in the 14660M, and you have the GMT in the 16700, all right? You're missing the dress watch, all right? So you could go with, uh, like I think Patek is the dress watch to have, okay? You go a little cheaper with uh, a JLC or, or Vaseron, is that what I would do? No. I mean, if I'm if, if if you want an objectively balanced collection, that's maybe what you should do. But that's not what I would do. I mean, look at my collection. I mean, I've got I've got six good watches, three GMTs, and three divers. That's the way I like it. And you know, is it a balanced collection? Objectively, no. But it's what I like. So um, I wouldn't go Patek, and I wouldn't go dress watch uh, unless unless that does speak to you unless you do feel like you want a, um, a dress watch and, and you want to make it more objectively balanced. But um, you're talking Kermit, you're talking Daytona. I th I'd say I go for those. All right, go for those. Um, but I just have to throw that out there because objectively that would, you know, your, your, uh, what you have maybe does call for, for a dress watch. But again, I wouldn't do it. So, um, all right. And then some other things uh, you could do. Uh, okay, I'm gonna throw out some things that I've thought about getting uh, and then talk about maybe why I didn't and maybe some of this will resonate with you or not. Glycine, all right, a pre-Invicta Glycine. Uh, glycine is an affordable watch if you buy and pre-owned. Uh, I think retail, there's something like about 2,000, but I think you can get them for, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars And it's sort of a legitimate, you know, watch uh, with history, and um, they were purchased by Invicta in 2016. So I think a pre-Invicta glycine could be an affordable and and cool watch. Now that's what I thought about getting, but am I going to wear it? Probably not. I think the novelty would wear off very quickly. Um, so I could recommend something like that to you, but. Um, and look, that might be kind of nice because you have pretty high-end pieces. You don't, you're going to want to be careful with that chronograph your dad gave you. And, and you know, don't, you don't have a beater. So that could be, you know, a mid-tier yet really, truly um, historically significant watch, um, but it doesn't break the bank. All right, so that's, that's one idea. Um, but you might you might set your it could be a waste of money if you're not going to wear it okay but but it would be it would be a, a a nice a nice beater you know if if that's what you want to go with all right another thing what about this a submariner bluesy all right and i would get let's see i would get a pre ceramic with the solid inlay that would have the gold gold in the clasp and you know i've thought about getting one of those why i mean i've i've railed against precious metal watches and the blinginess and stuff. But look, that that's a beautiful watch. I think the dial is phenomenal. And you know, your your two Rolexes are kind of like my, you know, three GMTs and three dive watches. They're all the same. I mean, I know they aren't to us, but most people would look at these watches. They're steel, they're swivelly bezeled watches. They're the, they're the same, you know, they're, they're basically the same watch, you know, um, your, your sub and your GMT, my wife would look at these pieces and be like, that, this is the same watch. I see one is a little more colorful, same watch. All right. So for that reason, something like, uh, a two-tone bluesy would just be different. It would like pop you in your mouth when you look down and saw it. I mean, it would, you know, and, and that's kind of, nice and for me getting out of your comfort zone could be kind of interesting and it might reveal aspects of yourself that 
you haven't uncovered yet. And, um, and what you thought you didn't like, you might grow to love. It could be like opening a, a can of worms though, <laughs> you know, the, down the path of two-tone and precious metal watches. But, but I think the two-tone blo bluesy is well within your price range. And, and I think they'll probably, you know, the pre-ceramics have a lot of uh, investment potential in the future. And um, it would give you the blue dial. It would give you a diver with a date. And it would give you a two-tone watch, a little bit of bling, um, a little bit of gold. You, ha you have the strength of the, the steel uh, reinforcing that, that ribbon of metal down the bracelet. So it's, 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 it's got that strength. Um, I think it's a, it's a good option. Um, something to consider, right? Now, he, he didn't give me anything to work with, which was kind of awesome because now I can just sort of throw things out and, and, uh, I'm glad he didn't because it didn't give me any, any sort of constraints. And, uh, and so, yeah. All right, another thing is an Explorer 2. Now, next year, 2021, is the 50th anniversary of the Explorer 2. And so I think an Explorer 2, either 40 millimeter or 42 millimeter, probably the 42 millimeter, because they're gonna change that one. Uh, I think that's gonna possibly be altered, changed in some way, and, and it could go up in the future. Now, here's the thing. I've thought about getting that too, but. But here's the thing, I don't like the 42 millimeter Explorer 2. And so uh, I think there's two things you wanna look for, watches you love and watches that have good uh, investment potential and retention of value. And while this has great potential, I don't like the watch so much. So I don't wanna be stuck with it. And if something happens and, you know, and, and and prices don't go up. I don't want to be stuck with a 42 millimeter Explorer 2, all right? Um, so that's why I'm resisting. But if you like the 42 millimeter Explorer 2, I think now's the time to get one before something happens with it next year. Um, if you like that watch, if you don't, the 40 millimeter Explorer 2 is another option. It would give you a white dial. You've already got a GMT, um, but it's it's a it's a different watch, and and I think again you'll be able to get out of it in the future and and make some money potentially and uh, wear it for free if nothing else, okay? So that is another option. And I will just say that, you know, another option is just to, to look at steel pieces, okay? And in your market, in your area, uh, I'm sure there's a, you know, um, internet, Chrono 24 or whatever, and 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 I use I use Rakuten here in Japan. But here here's sort of a, a a blue chip move. You go for a steel professional Rolex, and and you get the cheapest one. Okay, now what I get the cheapest the cheapest one is often a tritium dialed watch. So I would get the cheapest of um, the Swiss or Swiss made dials. Why the cheapest? Okay, well. Unless it's a real beat up watch, and, and sometimes those do come up, but but if it looks all right, then it's going to be one of the cheapest, which means um, you're going to pay the lowest price pretty much in the country. And in a couple of years, uh, when everything goes higher, uh, you will have gotten the cheapest one. Uh, you see what I'm saying? All right, so uh, this would be the case with uh, a sub, a date sub, GMT, any of the swivelly bezeled steel sports watches. Um, the Explore, the Milgauss, I don't I don't think they are as popular. They're sort of what I call second tier professional steel models, but something like a GMT, GMT Master 2, Explore 2, um, uh, the the 16600, the the Sea Dweller, uh, pre-ceramic Sea Dweller, you know, you you get the cheapest one out there, assuming it's just not beat to hell, you know, through a moderately, fairly priced, yet cheapest one out there, and you wait a couple of years, you just watch, it, it happened with the P-Serial GMT, and just everything has gone up, and, and you know, because it was the cheapest one here, and so, you see what I'm saying, okay? So that's sort of a, 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 a blue chip option, and a way to ensure that you've got a, a watch that is gonna really retain value. And, and of course, of those cheapest pieces, 
you know, you go for uh, you go for box papers, and if you, and if you can find one unpolished, then that's great. Now, uh, if you go to a gray market dealer, oftentimes they have they have uh, watchmakers sort of on site or that they work with so closely. If it's not perfect, they send it there. It gets a polish, right? Then it's not unpolished anymore, right? Uh, but things like pawn shops are great because pawn shops they, they really don't want to have a watch service they, they want to get a watch tech on a little bit and sell it you know they don't want to have to deal with it if it's running de decently and they're more likely to take a sort of a beat up watch and and just just put a kind of a low price on it uh, to keep from having a fool with it and try and sell it we want those beat up watches because those are potentially unpolished pieces all right so I would I would hit the pawn shops and I would look get out your loop and look for uh, box and papers unpolished pieces at, at real cheap prices so that's uh, whatever you go for go for uh, I think if you go that route I think you're gonna be okay if it's if it's a steel professional swiftly bezel 40 millimeter Rolex watch okay so that's what I think you should do I, I tend to say relax and take your time you know you just got the the GMT in 2019 but to be honest you know when it comes to uh, at least the five digit market uh, I think sooner is better I think you you, you really don't have time to, to wait uh, um, I'm glad I didn't wait you know I'm because each each year just things change by a thousand or two thousand dollars so uh, you really don't have time to wait I don't want to rush you but um, I'm tempted to say just relax you got a great collection just enjoy it but uh, but if, if you do want to you know add up five digits sooner is always better than later all right guys help Tom out um, he he's open to uh, hearing some ideas I'm, I'm sure and hey do you have some ideas for Tom better than mine were um, please help Tom out and Tom thanks for the question if you've got a question for me well check out the description of this video and uh, it'll tell you how you can get yourself a custom video for as little as $10. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comment section. See you next time.